So Simon, um, thanks again for, for coming along. The last time we met, we were right in the lockdown and we, most of us getting used to that. How has the profession changed now? What's happened? What's changed now? We're, we're, we're out of the um, depths of that lockdown. Okay, well, thanks very much, Coral, and good evening, everybody. And greetings from sunny Tooting Beck. Uh, those of you who haven't already been to the Law Society in Chancery Lane, as and when it's open, you'll be absolutely welcome anytime, whatever stage you've got to in your career. So to recap, the last time that I spoke, that some of you may well have been on that call and may have heard me sounding uncharacteristically for Simon Davis gloomy. Uh, I'm happy to say I'm much more optimistic, but that there are still some serious shadows ahead. Uh, on the Just a, a very quick recap for those of you who weren't there last time or aren't following this uh, very closely. The arrival of the virus impacted on certain firms and um, certain practice areas brutally, and I use that word uh, deliberately. Uh, immigration virtually came to a standstill. Convincing where you couldn't even go to look around a property, uh, fell off a cliff. Crime, jury trials, poof, vanished. Magistrates' courts, only urgent high priority business. Then as we move forward a bit, personal injury. Uh, people were not at work, people were not driving. People not doing anything, people don't get hurt. So as a result, all that work very much came to a halt. Those firms which were more dependent on commercial work, I think saw the impact a little bit differently in the sense that many of their uh, deals and transactions were already in the pipeline and carried on and weren't impacted so immediately severely by the ceasing of activity uh, of their clients. However, so far as those firms were concerned, much greater feeling of uncertainty because they knew and still know that major problems are going to be coming down the line. They still don't know to what extent the global recession is going to be as serious as some people say. Some are out there saying we're going to see a fall in GDP in the United Kingdom of about 30%. What that translates into is still down the line a, a real worry that commercial clients and also those you've mentioned a number of the people on the line from overseas that the kind of global deals and cross-border work which we are so well known for and do so well at as a as a, an economy people and uh, and solicitors may fall off so what are we seeing now convincing work coming back uh, very fast uh, you've started to see some of the very first jury trials. We might cover that Carl, a little bit later on because it's a very interesting topic uh, on its own. Uh, you see that uh, anything to be crude about it, which has the word distress in it and distress at its heart, this kind of work is, is, is there in abundance. Tech, I was talking to a firm only the other day who was saying that there's still substantial investment within this country and from outside coming in into the tech area and people being more positive on the commercial front. So while there are still some serious shadows ahead, I think the shadows are more ones of uncertainty and in, and in relation to an area which we will, and I would like to come on to, the publicly funded work, and particularly in the, the criminal area, uh, some shadows which were there before the whole era started and impacted and are still going to be there afterwards. But I would say, if you'd ask me, we're heading, by the way, to 100 days next week, Coral, of the lockdown. Uh, surprisingly, if you'd asked me, say, 60 days ago, where I thought we'd be now, I'd have been, a, a, I'd been in a much more unhappy frame of mind. Okay, well, thank you for that really helpful overview. You'll remember that last time we had people online who were furloughed and worried about their jobs, as indeed there are now. And I just wondered what advice you would give to somebody who's um, in that situation. They've either been made redundant or worried about it. What's the best uh, way of protecting your skills and so on? Okay, um, excuse me, because some of the tips I'm going to give probably now and during the course of this are going to sound a, a little bit trite but they're trite because they're true. The first is to have confidence. You will not have turned into a um, poor, as in the sense of inadequate skills solicitor overnight. 
you're to the extent you're at the moment having problems in finding a job as somebody who's looking for a training contract, all the skills and all the qualities that you had before still remain. So that's the first important point because you may, may be a surprising piece of advice, but sometimes the decisions which people make in their lives, which are the worst, are the ones where they have approached their lives and decisions with a lack of self-confidence rather than the confidence which you should have. I think now is the time absolutely to be creative. And I think if I were you, I, I would sort of go through a nice little menu. First is, are you happy with the work you are doing right now? I run a kind of informal careers counselling service in Chancery Lane over cups of coffee. And there are obviously people who have started off, they've got a training contract, they've qualified into an area which they don't actually like. It's not really suited to them. Now is the perfect time to be contemplating that move because a lot of people are going to be moving and people aren't so much going to be looking at you and saying, well, why are you moving? So if you're, um, if you're, you're unhappy with the department you're in, you're unhappy with the practice area you've chosen, now it's just a great time to be moving. Uh, those of, of you uh, who are considering uh, uh, whether there's a route for you in what I might call the more orthodox way forward, a law firm, relax. First of all, do have in mind that there are increasing numbers of companies, banks, local government, all now starting to take on trainees, often neglected. And we have a list at the Law Society which we can share with you. And many of them are, are um, absolutely are going to be expanding. The in-house community is the fastest expanding group of solicitors in the land. So don't forget them. Also, just think about, sometimes people think a bit narrowly and think of themselves as a solicitor. Actually, you're an extremely skilled analyst, researcher, writer. Think about other other areas where you may be very much wanted because of the skills you have, rather than being an orthodox solicitor. Now, I'll give you a very good example. If you go into many companies now, you will find a really important part of their work are, have titles such as public affairs, regulatory affairs, governance, risk, compliance, all kinds of areas where they were hugely welcome, and I know this, having acted for a number of those kind of institutions, hugely welcome lawyers with that skill set. Think about those out there who are um, always going to be hiring. That's the, the uh, enforcers, people at the Serious Fraud Office, Financial Conduct Authority, Competition and Markets Authority. Look at the people out there who are going to be stepping in and looking for trouble and stopping it. So I, I think that um, now is, is the time. And, and by the way, anything that you may be concerned about as may not be an asset, turn into one. I've had some questions which have come in. One from, from a, a guy who I'm not going to say is elderly because his age is suspiciously close to mine. Um, but he's concerned as in the fact that he's of a certain age. Is that going to be held back? Of course, there may be people who say, hmm, not don't like look of that age turn that round and talk about the huge experience which you will you will have in, in, in not just legal but everything that you have learned which would be relevant to be a lawyer and bang those qualities hard my own perception now is that while of course it's great to be time to be young people are really valuing experience out there so hit that experience hard uh, then there's those who come from um, the european union concerned are we still going to be an open jurisdiction absolutely completely uh, we're a very open jurisdiction to the extent you have a a, a second language or indeed it may be your first hugely important again look at that and think of firms let's say if you're french or german or spanish uh, if you're coming from the european union look for firms which have offices in those areas look for firms on their websites which are, seek to attract those kind of, uh, of, of clients from those areas and so turn yourself in, into a, an asset there will be those i was asked also to the extent with that is there going to be an issue to the extent that uh, you have come uh, your bame uh, again these are ones where you just focus on what you have to offer uh, and do not be concerned uh, about what anybody's uh, attitude may be 
you just just proceed on, on the basis that people will take you on your merit unless and until you're disappointed. And if you are uh, experience any problems in that kind of area, then you contact the Law Society uh, pronto. Um, so overall, I'd say approach this with confidence. Now is actually a great time to be rethinking your, your career in a way without anybody wondering why you're doing it. And we're here to help you. And by the way, on the foreign side, in terms of that, I mean the uh, overseas lawyers, of course, Cole herself will be able to point you in, in the way of the, the forum uh, for international lawyers, uh, which again is a wonderful hub for people to network and exchange experience. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, excellent advice. I think really helpful. Uh, and you've covered a couple of the um, inquiries we had that came kindly in um, in advance from the audience. Yeah. So I'm going to turn now to um, the issue of smaller firms in particular, because obviously technology has been critical to get through this crisis. Um, it's the smaller firms that often haven't been able to invest as heavily. Um, what, what support is there for them from the Law Society? I think if we start, and I'll try if it's okay in, in all these answers to try, try to be a bit broader than the actual question, is that the, the first is that there's a great deal of jargon out there, often even people are unable to agree on what's law tech or, or legal tech. And again, I, would, I wouldn't worry about, about do you understand what any of these terms mean because you don't need to. The real point and the one I'm going to focus on for the moment in relation to most firms, the starting point is which pieces of technology are there out there which will help the human being provide a service to a client in trouble, which makes it more efficient, which makes it cheaper, and which adds to the quality of the life often of the lawyer who's providing that service. So it's contrasted now with the life of Simon Davis, a thousand years ago, uh, it would be not unusual for a trainee, as in me, to go and spend three months in a trading estate looking through boxes of dusty documents, which I did for a, a long period uh, after I qualified in case the SRA, wondering if I had appropriate training. Uh, and um, But now that would all be done by machines. And this is a good thing. So in relation to the, the smaller firms, or indeed medium firms, and, and it actually applies to some of the larger firms too. The real core focus is what do you actually need to do your job and to help you do your job more effectively? So again, it's looking at the basics. Communication with clients, what we're on now, Zoom, Teams, the rest of the, or the visual and audio visual techniques which are out there. These are fabulous for being in touch with clients helping actually bring a human face more than maybe there was before when people speak on telephone. And that does not require a significant investment. Uh, secondly, how are you able to remotely access documents? Again, none of this requires a major investment, whether you're talking about cloud or whatever system you're using for your documents. Uh, and uh, electronic signatures, to the extent that firms are then wanting to move into those which do involve, let's say, algorithms or some significant capital investment, again, I think firms all over the, the place, whatever kind of size they are, are being very careful right now about, about making any kind of investment like that, because it's rather like all of us as, as people who aren't running law firms, the moment you decide to buy a piece of tech, it's already out of date. And many of these firms, it's a significant investment. So I think you're going to see people waiting to see what pieces of theater worked really well. And the Law Society there is a great equalizer. We spend time with small, medium firms. We have tech talks which travel the country with people explaining to them, here's a piece of software you might find useful. Here's how you, how, how, um, you are able to access it. Here's what it costs. Here's, uh, and so practical uh, tips rather than uh, in, in any sense, trying the law site itself to fund it. So information, but again, I think the um, things like the audio visual and visual are going to be great equalizers for, uh, for firms, particularly those who previously may have considered that they had a geographical challenge. Again, that's going to be great equalizer, equalizer uh, for them. 
Fabulous, thank you. So I'd like to move now to the Law Society's campaign on criminal work, and that's been very um, active about the payments and so on. Could you just summarise what the position is and what you hope to achieve and why there's a problem? Yeah. Okay, uh, let me start on this. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not particularly familiar with the stage which all your listeners have got to in their careers, but I'm going to proceed on, on the, the, the starting point of this answer, that there are those at university, uh, those who are now at the University of Law, those who may have just left, those at the very early stages of their career. Go and be a criminal lawyer. It's fantastic. I, I tell you, this is not being me being condescending or patronizing. I have spent much of the last few months almost exclusively with, um, with law practitioners. Uh, well, I would say, or exclusively, that sounds like an exaggeration, a great deal of time. Uh, and indeed, in the context of us getting the courts back on their feet, uh, until recently, I was on a call now every single day with the Ministry of Justice. And I talk to these people and the passion that they have, the humor they show, the, the experiences which they are getting uh, and the people who they are representing, uh, often some of the most unfortunate in society. Yeah, this is a great job. So go for it. My job and the job of the Law Society is to try to persuade this government and previous uh, governments have, have all had the same failing, that the legal aid system is one which is worth investing significant amounts in. And by that I mean it cannot be right uh, that people who are contemplating a career as a criminal lawyer, as I urge you to do, to find that, they, that there's a risk that they will struggle to make a living at it, or having got in, that struggle to be able to stay in uh, the uh, the profession having got in, uh, in the context of the virus, just before the virus arrived, the position was years, decades of underinvestment. The rates which were being paid to the criminal duty solicitors hadn't been increased since, hang, your, hang on to your hats, 1998, gone down in 2014. Uh, so no, one, no wonder there's a challenge out there. Uh, and uh, and there are uh, complexities uh, in the way in which legal aid payments are made, which mean that there are people right now who are absolutely struggling. So in relation to that, we're trying to get the mechanics for, for payment changed. Uh, and I'm, I, I think I'm right to be optimistic about that. There are going to be some accelerated payments, I hope, also going to be coming in. Accelerated, I mean, in the context of there being a broader review of sustainability of the criminal uh, legal aid system. There is going to be a review, and I hope that that will come up with what I would say is the uh, blindingly obvious answer, which is that the criminal justice system should be treated no differently to the NHS. Uh, this is something which deserves proper uh, investment and funding. And we cannot allow ourselves ever to get to a system where there's an unlevel playing field. And by that, I mean that last year, the CPS, packed for great solicitors, by the way, so it's nothing about the CPS, and were given an injection of about 89 million pounds for them to recruit about another 300 prosecutors. And they're out there recruiting. And where are they naturally going to be recruiting in the defence population? So I, I think we really need to see uh, some a, a recognition as to what these solicitors do. And we need that recognition to be coming pretty fast, not just in relation to warm words, what a great job you all do, uh, but some hard cash. Thank you very much. And more generally um, with the court. So I know you, you mentioned earlier on that the, the, all the uh, jury trials have stopped, but there's also been a lot of activity in the civil courts and online doing things on Zoom and so on. Huge disparity in views there. What's the position of the Law Society regarding online courts? Okay, uh, I think that, uh, again, it, find a nice starting point. Uh, like most, not just the questions you put, but I think the, the kind of questions which most people are addressing in almost any subject 
And your starting point is what are you trying to achieve? And often the answers uh, uh, to these kind of questions start from the wrong way around. And, and the answer is what is what is the system we have now and how can we change it? No. Here's the question. What are you trying to achieve? And what are you trying to achieve in a system of justice? All of us will be familiar with the phrase that justice must be done, but also seen to be done. But it must also feel uh, that it's being done. It is not an acceptable system of justice if people in the system, those who may find themselves convicted, those who lose cases, those who lose custody of their children, those who find themselves in a, in a real hole facing loss of liberty. If these consider at the end of a particular hearing or, or a system, not only do they get a really bad result, people get bad results, but they must not feel that they got a bad result because they didn't get a fair crack of the whip and to get a fair, didn't get a fair hearing. And I really struggle based on everything I've heard out there spend a huge amount of time with practitioners, not just, of course, criminal, but family being another good example, um, as to, do you really, is there really a place for a remote hearing where you're talking about children, your liberty, your livelihood? Is it really right that you should not be able to um, spend time physically in a court with a judge seeing the witnesses. I really struggle with that, and I hope that most people do. On the other hand, there is, must be a room, and a, and a serious amount of room, for making processes much more efficient. You shouldn't be, you really shouldn't in this day and age see people walking down the Strand and Fleet Street with massive great trolleys of cardboard boxes. Uh, you, you really shouldn't find yourself where um, people are uh, arriving at court with bundles of documents under their arms or go into a courtroom and see a judge or the parties peering over an enormous stack. Uh, and that, a lot of that is now being uh, reduced. Similarly, there must be many, there are many cases where having it dealt with purely online is entirely sensible. You'll find there are many areas such as cons concerns about um, consumer goods, service, if you've got a problem with you know, whatever happened to you on a, on a uh, holiday, or, or maybe a holiday is not a good example, maybe the fact that the, the planes were delayed, or there are all kinds of things we really shouldn't have to, to um, spend time uh, with a, a human being who's not necessarily adding value. But where there is room, where the human being adds real value and ensures that people feel that justice has been done. I think it's absolutely crucial. So I don't think you'll ever hear from the law society some kind of sort of Luddite, we don't like technology, what we're most interested in jobs for lawyers, jobs for solicitors, that's our starting point is about what's the right thing for justice. And you can see that right now in the context of jury trials. It'd be quite easy for the solicitor profession out there to be saying, oh, well, we understand now there's a proposal that juries don't have to be there. They can appear remotely and could be never see anybody in real life. And uh, that might be good for the legal profession because more work comes back. But you see us uniformly saying, ah, that's a really worrying development uh, to find that the, the, pro the prospect that the jury trials um, are going in some way to be affected. I think it's something that's going to be watched Thank really you closely. very much. I've got one more question before I turn to questions that are coming in from um, people listening. And um, this question is really because you recently gave a lecture about to the IBA, I believe, about the future of the law firm and what it would look like. So can you describe to us the future of a law firm? And I'm talking of ev in every sense, office spent space, flexible working, impact on diversity. Right. So that, that's obviously the answer. The, the key, key, key invitation or an obvious invitation for me to speak for 30 minutes with that interruption because there's actually there's, there is I mean seriously there's a huge amount to cover so let me just try and try and put into 
words of, or not so much one syllable but some nuggets as to what i think is likely to be happening over the next so three six months and deep possibly for even longer than that first um this isn't just simon dave sort of making it all up as i said my, my, as i said my boiling spare room uh, i spent uh, i talked about the criminal lawyers talked about um the family lawyers but i spent a lot of time with um uh, all kinds of firms so yesterday uh, I was in East Anglia remotely, I was in Wales remotely, I was in the southwest of, of England and I was in London the week before. I was remotely in uh, Germany twice uh, and in South Korea. And talking about what's next, what's it going to look like? And I would say there are actually some quite interesting, broad and consistent themes emerging. Let's start with the office. If you and I, as, as we were having this conversation, say 60 days ago, uh, and you'd ask me, Simon, is this the death of the office? I might have said that you, you're going to see a massive reduction in the use of offices because the reaction at the time was everyone was so excited. Oh, it's amazing. Why weren't we doing this before? Oh, this is so brilliant. Oh, gosh, what a waste of, of um, money those offices have been. Now, much cooler, calmer, view and analysis the the starting point is right okay let's remind ourselves what is the purpose of the office why do we have it and there the answer is so we spend time with each other we spend time learning from each other we work together in teams we see role models in action we develop by the way human relationships friendships close connections uh, and particularly for the younger lawyers, although the older ones should still be developing as well, learning by doing with other people. Then you ask yourself the question, is that what we use our office for? Because you will find that there are, by definition, human beings and firms out there where doors are closed, where people come in, work for 12 hours a day or whatever it is, and go home with hardly speaking to anybody, or send an email or in the habit of sending emails to somebody sitting 16 feet away um i think you're going to get a you are seeing a real rethink what's the office for and are we making the most use of it as it is i've spoke to a firm two firms uh, last week who had design consultants in not just from the point of view by the way of social distancing but of course as we speak that's very important and getting people back into the office safely but thinking much more holistically what should the office look like in the future if we're making the office do what it should do which is everything that you can't do really when you're sitting at home and that's going to be the key so i'm not saying everyone's going to go and plan by the way but you are going to see so i think some real serious shifts in the way in which the office works secondly and uh, the communication from the office uh, not now just talking about the habits of emailing and calling people within the office but people sitting in their offices calling their and contacting their clients many of them that would be but it's obviously a combination telephone email face to face but i've seen increasingly a reduction in the face to face all kinds of reasons people are more familiar with email telephone too busy, um, but not necessarily that kind of great enthusiasm to get out of the office. Now I think you're going to find with Zoom and Teams, etc., greater use of those pieces of technology when communicating with clients rather than the telephone and email. And I think that'd be real positive. So then home. Um, there are, uh, I think there are many people, certainly many I've spoken to, and I think I'm actually one of them uh, who have always said, slight concern that when people are not in the office and at home you know, are they really working at, as hard uh, as they should be um, you, you, would people tend to be working from home on a Monday or a Friday which tend to see you have a bit of a raised eyebrow or were they able to really be a fantastic part of the team working from home and I think you know, I've been totally wrong, totally. Um, and uh, I'm happy to accept that. And I think that what you're likely to see 
in relation to people realizing how well people can work from home, that these sort of raised eyebrows, particularly I'm now talking about women and, and men who, by the way, are increasingly being the carers at home. I think that you're likely to see something really quite positive coming out of this. And when somebody says, is it okay if I work from home two days a week? Okay. It's virtually compulsory. It's fantastic. Please do it. I think this has been really, really interesting. I think the idea that eyebrows be raised about people wanting to work from home you know, two days a week, three days, gone. This is terrific. Uh, the concern I have is uh, I was spoke when I spoke to a solicitor from Wales, who's, who's senior, a senior partner in his firm, yesterday. He said, at the moment, of course, there's always you know, that discussion, Coral, about the world divides into, and you don't always get it right. But he said, he thought the world roughly dividing into those desperate to get back to work, those desperate to say, stay at home, and those who'd probably like a bit of more flexibility. And that's perhaps a, a statement of the obvious. Uh, but it does show you need to be careful that you don't start making the mistake, which many law firms make and many organizations do, of treating everybody as if they're exactly the same. This really needs some very close individual attention. What suits individuals? And I think that's a really important theme. What, what, you know, and people, I would hope that people will speak to every individual and say, what suits you best rather than have blanket diktats from now on Everybody will be doing this, or everybody doing that. Really close personal attention. And the reason why this is so important is because I've certainly heard, I'd say pretty uniformly, from firms that they are seeing greater productivity from people working from home. For those of you who aren't yet, aren't yet in law firms, you complete a timesheet for it, and you do also regularly in-house which shows how you're dividing your day and how much of the time you're spending is chargeable to clients and, and, and which is, is not. Uh, and they are seeing, many of the law firms, as those chargeable hours soaring, which is good for the law firm's economics. But one partner I was speaking to yesterday said, I think perhaps disturbingly, that he was seeing the amount of chargeable hours at weekends starting to go up too. Now, if that means that because more and more people are working from home, that they're getting to the position, well, I'm at home, mm, what should I do? Oh, I might as well go and do some work. Uh, then, I, you know, we, we, I, I worry about stress and burnout. I'll be very frank with you. I'm a deeply energetic person. Um, but having worked from even a relatively late start, you know, 8.30, 9 o'clock by 6.30, Coral, I'm absolutely whacked, absolutely gone, nothing left to offer. Uh, and, and I wasn't like that when I was in the office because I had a commute, I'd read a paper, read a book. I'd go to meetings. I, I had natural breaks built in during the day. It's quite hard to build in natural breaks at home. Even if you say, oh, I'm gonna go for a walk around the park now. Often I'm thinking about work. It's not really a break. Um, and so I think you will find that they're going to if you're going to have people spending more time at home, they really need to be carefully looked after. So there's a bit of a ramble, but I'm, I think that you're going to see offices used better, pieces of communication used better, flexible working being regarded as a plus rather than a raised eyebrow. I think this is going to be, I hesitate to use the words, totally brilliant, but I really do think. Oh, so the last thing in terms of recruitment, because that's very important, getting back to those who are worried. A number of firms I've spoken to say that because of remote working, it has expanded massively their recruitment footprint. Uh, I'm also seeing a firm I spoke to saying that the number of people they're now seeing who were contacting them from London interested in a move. This is all really interesting as well. So they, it's going to help firms, as I said about 20 minutes ago, who make so they have got a geographical disadvantage may find actually some major pluses. They're going to be able to say they're cheaper than other firms, uh, but also they are just as connected with clients uh, and colleagues through technology. The CPS in the West Midlands, uh, I think, now has a very large percentage of their prosecutors uh, working uh, remotely and out of the office. It's working really well. So I think it's giving us all kinds of of, uh, of interesting benefits, but not not the demise of the office.
Brilliant, thank you. That's a fantastic vision of the future. I certainly echo what you say about that feeling of exhaustion from, and you summarise very well why it's so much more tiring sometimes. Well, it's, it's, by way, it's, 20, it's 20 to 7, so based on what people just said, if I, if I, if I look sort of one uh, <laughs> because of that. Okay. So, um, as we expected, we've got a very large number of questions about diversity. We had some in advance, there's some in the chat box. Before going on to that, I just want to say we won't have time. There's also quite a lot of questions about careers and um, mentors and information that is actually on websites. So perhaps what Maria and I can do afterwards is put together a list, but it will be solicitors, regulation, authority, law, society, chambers and so on. But we, we can sort that out because it, the information is there. Um, while we've got Simon here, I really want to um, raise the issue of diversity. A lot of people have referred, obviously, to um, the situation in America after the um, death of George Floyd and they're asking um, questions do you think racism exists in the legal profession what's the law society doing um, and in particular some questions about the Equality Act but let, let me um, allow you to say say some general points first of all yeah I'm general I think I've tried to be as specific as I can Again, if, if, if I just sort of stand back and, and, and helpfully, I think, start from the beginning. If you had been, or as I was, when I talk about it, 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 standing, looking at the legal profession and its challenges in, let's take, beginning of January this year. When I was out there talking to law firms, the area which I think there, with the exception, getting back to my old friends, the criminal legal aid and, of course, the civil legal aid area, uh, and, to, and to, to ask about what challenges they were really going to be getting stuck in, to, and I mean that word, those words seriously, in the next 12 months, two years. Profit was not one for the obvious reasons. Firms, by and large, doing quite well. So what was, the, what was high up on their agenda? Uh, for Some people may raise an eyebrow right now about what I'm about to say, but I did hear from firm after firm Rather, as you're seeing with many corporates out there, a challenge to make sure as a firm that they had a real sense of purpose, social purpose, joining in with the community, uh, really grappling with uh, gender inequality, um, really getting stuck in relation to social mobility and um, BAME. Uh, candidates. I'll come back to that in a moment because it's been a specific question raised and is obviously particularly topical in, in the light of the really awful events in the United States uh, and also the LGBT community. And of course, getting back to the gentleman uh, who asked me the question, making sure that we're also not just proceeding on the basis that this is a profession for the young, by the way. And last, and absolutely not least, because I think it is a community which is sometimes overlooked and overshadowed by other um, obvious challenges which are more high profile, is the disabled. They may be a small number, but you know, my, my goodness, they need to be treated uh, very seriously. So those were, I tell you, absolutely high on the agenda of, of law firms and therefore really about people. Uh, and so in terms of, so what do we do about it then and what do we do about it now? Because I'm very pleased to reassure you, this isn't something where the legal professional or the law society suddenly work, got out of bed one day and said, oh, there are things we really need to be looking at because they have been looked at uh, for some while. So how do, we, how do we deal with these challenges? I'm going to tell you a little story because I think it's quite useful and I think quite illustrative and of my mindset. Um, there's a gentleman... In fact, he's now joined my old firm, Clever Chances, but it's not a plug for them or indeed for him. Uh, but he's a very nice man called Tiernan Brady. Tiernan ran the uh, same sex and civil marriage campaign in Southern Ireland. Uh, and you can imagine what that's like a deeply Catholic community. And he and his team started off by saying, Wow, on earth are we going to do this? And they found quite quickly that by saying to people, you are a homophobic, deeply illiberal bigot, 
just led to defensiveness. And no, I'm not. You must be talking about someone else. Oh, no, absolutely. However, they turned that round and said, do you believe in decency and kindness and fairness and treating people with respect and allowing individuals to be themselves? The answer from that came, oh, yes. Are you in favour of same-sex marriage? Oh, yes. In relation to the women's round tables, which we ran last year, again, the message for there is let's not get bogged down into who's doing something wrong, who's doing something right. But what are we doing about it? And I think the same absolutely in the context of um, the questions which were asked. And you may have seen the various pieces in various newspapers focusing I'm afraid to say the, the, the labels of black and bear me, um, I, I, as you probably gather from what I've just been saying a few moments ago, I, I much prefer to talk about people as individuals and treat them as individuals. And sometimes there's a whole risk by saying there's this whole community, how do we treat them? Which I think is a pretty ghastly starting point anyway. Uh, but th the way to, do, to, to ensure that people, I think, to use the phrase, getting a fair chance in society is to do what we've been doing, uh, which is to be spending time with firms. What are you doing out there to attract talent? It's no good saying, I don't have any barriers in my law firm, anyone can apply. There are many people out there who may well think that a firm is not for them. Many people out there who, who have little understanding of um, you know, what's a good interview, how to uh, apply, uh, and many people who, don't, who aren't even being encouraged to apply in the first place. And then when um, you, you have um, successful people coming into your firm and you proceed on the basis that all you're interested in is talent and ambition, not backgrounds or anything else, what are you doing to keep them? How are you making sure, again, that you do not pe treat people as a category, that you, the way you treat people is when you join this firm, you know, how do we make this all work for you? What suits you? Uh, and I think, certainly at one stage, one, almost one of the last appraisals I was doing for a partner, and I asked him the question, how do you think that people feel when they leave your office? That's quite an interesting question. Do they feel uplifted, motivated, excited, bounding down the corridor, or depressed, miserable, cut down? And I think if people ask themselves much more the question, when this person leaves my presence, whether that presence is an electronic one or a Zoom one or a physical one, how are they feeling about themselves after that? And I think that if people approach lives and their careers in this way, then we will see some real progress in this profession and others but which doesn't get held back by uh, people pointing, jabbing fingers at each other. I think we should get on with it and do something positive. Thank you. So what can the Law Society actually do to lead on some of these issues that people are concerned about, particularly if, I mean, I understand what you're saying about treating people as individuals, but certainly some people do feel there is systemic racism or, unconscious bias or, or whatever, how, how can that be tackled? Uh, the starting point has to be, as it, again, I'm going to sound like an individual obsessive, but uh, I think the, the best way again is try to, try to avoid um, thinking that the answer is about policies and being too centrist. I, I really do think it's about asking people what is the experience like in this firm for you? And talk to them in a very open way. And you might have your eyes open. I have a reverse mentor that did a, a clever chance um, from Bangladesh. And, and it's all, all about um, looking at the firm and looking at the profession through the eyes of those who are encountering prejudice. Uh, and to say to them, in, in terms of what you are seeing there, what would you like? To, what would you like to see changed? And uh, and and I think rather like any fine solicitor, rather than working out what their client wants, 
sitting in an office, goes and speaks to the client and says, what do you want? What do I need to do? Uh, and that's what the Law Society does and will obviously have to do a lot more of and, and is, is very, I would say, just open. Once feedback on, on what are the problems and challenges and worries out there, and right now is carrying out a, a specific piece of research um, in certain communities uh, to, to find out what are the experiences coming back and see what we can do about it. So it's, um, it's engaging with everybody who considers or indeed is experiencing prejudice and having themselves held back and treated and judged by anything which doesn't just involve their talent and potential. So to the extent that anybody who's listening to this says, I, you know, I experienced a, a problem and the way in which I would like to see law firms operate is this. And it's focus on the this, focus on the what action would you like to see taking place and share it. So in terms of um, actions, do you want to say something about what representation there is within council and how that's dealt with to make sure they are reaching out to all the relevant people? Yes, you, you, you have. Um, if I go back to when uh, we used to have physical admission ceremonies, and by the way, they will come back. Uh, and I stand there and I, I say that the Law Society has a support network and not in a condescending way support network in the sense of you can spend time with people who have possibly experiences like you uh, who have the same kind of challenges as you who may be role models and that will be because i know there's a large mix of people listening today that will be just as i talked about the forum for international lawyers uh, we have the young lawyers division we have the ethnic and minority lawyers division. Uh, we have sitting on top the um, the equality and diversity committee, uh, and we have particular representation on council to ensure that the again I use this, that those phrases which I'm not particularly comfortable with, but but ethnic minorities are effectively represented on council, uh, and uh, um, in, in, in that sense I'm very confident knowing that the strength of the personalities uh, who I know who sit on council and sit on the other committees and divisions that uh, if we were falling down on the kind of work we were doing they're the first to uh, remind us. Great thank you so one way to get involved is perhaps to go to the Law Society website and see the communities that yes. uh, exist isn't there. I've also got two, I know you, I will let you go. I'm sure it's very no, long. I'm, um, I'm, 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 I'm very happy. I, I, it's, this is, this is, if I, if when I was at whatever stage in my career, somebody was going to say, I can sit with the law Society president for an hour. Actually, I'm not sure I'd have wanted to, but, but, uh, but I'm very happy to sit as long as you want. Great. Thank you. Um, well, this one is uh, a question from somebody who's talking about the impetus for change coming really from clients um, and that Microsoft in the US has a preference for firms led by women or minorities, as he's put here or she's put here. Um, and just wondering whether a, that is really the change that makes things happen, what the clients demand, and whether you see that um, development in the UK. Uh, the, the short answer is, is yes and yes. Uh, and the longer one is that clients ultimately, whatever firm anybody listening to this is going to join, uh, always remember that without clients you are dust. Clients are, are the ones whose activity means that they want to employ you and they're the ones who pay the bills. But by the way, I always leave the paying bills bit, Carl, to the last. That's, that's not what I promise you which gets most lawyers out of bed. It's the client's problems. So you're going to listen very carefully to the clients and you are going to want as a firm to ensure that you are reflecting um, the the kind of client that you have. I think a word which, uh, whose significance is much misunderstood or, or ignored in, in society is the word familiarity. It's people often like to spend time with people with whom they feel familiar. They often like to recruit people 
who they feel familiar with. They spend, as I said, time the friendships of people who, who feel familiar. Uh, and uh, to the extent that you are with clients and their experience with the firm is an unfamiliar one and they're meeting people who are, don't resonate with their own client base, you know, you've got a, got a problem. So the first one I think you will see clients wanting to see your firms reflect more of themselves. Uh, and, uh, you, uh, and also, uh, many of the clients themselves are um, very, uh, very much at the forefront of um, ensuring that diversity, and I, we've talked about a, a number of particular areas today, you'll find that, um, I'll give you a good example, um, when I did a pitch to a particular bank, pitch being a, trying to show that you are worthy of getting some business, uh, we attended with a panel, which was a, a mix of, of, of people on the panel. And afterwards, the bank said, you realise the panel before you consisted of four men. And they said that with, they thought was entirely unacceptable. Um, so yes, that you will find that firms of all kinds will be out there saying, what are we doing to make sure that we have a diverse legal profession? Uh, and in the, in the proper sense, I think of the word, which is saying, um, if you if you really want to be uh, good lawyers, if you really want to be giving great advice, then just having that given by people who have had the same monochromatic experience throughout their lives, I think almost by definition suggests that something's going to be missed. You need to have people around the table from with all kinds of different experience uh, and uh, and attitudes. So um, yes and yes. Thank you very much. I think we will um, bring this to a, a close now. Maria, I don't know if you wanted to add anything, but as I said, we'll try and send out um, to people just some websites and so on, which we can certainly help with in relation to some of the questions. Um, we could literally be here another hour if I took everybody. So I'm really sorry to everyone that I couldn't um, squeeze in your question. Um, but it was fascinating, Simon. Thank you. And particularly interesting to think about the, the, the future of the law firm. Okay, well, it's been a real pleasure and look forward to seeing some of you, if not all of you, at some stage in Chancery Lane. Become criminal lawyers, become solicitors. If things go, get you, you're worried about something, things aren't going as you wish, contact the Law Society. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Bye then.